not like a 10, 15 pip move. You get a 50 pip spike, 100 pip spike in one line. Now, now the directional trend is when, uh, well, have to look at the headlines of the actual minutes that came out, what were the comments that came out, as to then what's going to be the overlying trend that now materializes. So one of the things that key, which we talked about before, is not trying to be super aggressive and hit that first move. Now, for what's the move line for the next minutes, hour, possibly even the rest of the day? Um, when everyone's back, what I'll do is I'll quickly do a short review of the Bank of England broken into its parts to review a little bit practically of what we did on Monday. Because, like what you were saying, hold, so 9 0, 0.75%, so on and so on. Actually, what you can do is have this predefined list of what you're looking for, but already you can remove quite a lot of the variables because the likelihood of it being 9 0 and 0.75% is incredibly high. So there's no point in worrying about it. So therefore, you can be a little bit more specific about the exact catalyst that will create the movement. It's almost a no-brainer, 9-0. Of course, it could be 8-1 or whatever, but the likelihood of that is so incredibly small, we discount it as an option, because it's not worth you know, stressing about. Right. The press conference could be now key, because that's when we get some detail as to his assessment in addition to then the minutes that are <laughs> So, yeah, let's, well, if we've got the headlines up here, let's see what they've typed up so far. <coughs> so you basically, you can take quite a multifaceted event and make it much more simplistic when you know how to approach it. It's a bit more manageable there. So look, here are, here are what they've done on the headline feed. Well, let me just record this. So So th these are the comments from the minutes the statement. So for Brexit, maintain assumption of a smooth adjustment to the average range of possible outcomes. I don't know if um, Tommaso had this walk on about 15 minutes ago, I just did a rundown for Bank of England. And that's exactly the same language as what was used to identify the situation before. Absolutely not new. Just a copy, literally, word document, copy, paste, repeat. Uh, which was kind of what I was intonating towards this morning, which is there's no real need for him to alter what he said last time with that specific language because he has no further clarity of what the outcome's going to be. We're in exactly the same position. Now, he can't be stressing, saying in his language, I'm really scared about Brexit and its impact on the, economic, uh, the economy it might have, because he needs to also manage the situation that on the balance of probabilities, we're going to have an orderly Brexit. So why is he going to talk down the market now? So remember, he needs to keep a constant continuity to his messaging. He can't go, well, there's risk of a no deal, now we're thinking quite dovish. Oh no, March 29th transition, we need to now start thinking about tightening policy because inflation might come. Can't afford to do that. He will lose all credibility, as we said on Monday, very quickly. So he almost needs to toe the line. If you're a Bank of England member now, what can you do? Can't do anything because the biggest outcome is going to influence your projections is totally out of your control. So all you can do is just kind of stand pat, which ultimately translates into a fairly, I guess, benign event where it doesn't really create massive shocks in the market. Um, well, look, let's have a quick look at some of the other stuff. Growth, global growth continues to slow in recent months. Uh, largely reflecting Brexit uncertainty. MPC expect UK growth to recover later this year. So they're still, you know, on the balance of probabilities, their language, they still expect an orderly Brexit. So the GDP forecasts, as per the government, as per the NISA, the third party bodies, they all expect that we're in the dip at the moment, but then it's going to not shoot through the roof, it's just not going to rapidly decline any further because this is the worst point of the Brexit process now. Inflation slipped to 2.1% in December. So inflation, in actuality, has been weakened quite quickly, but it's weakened to target. It's expected to slip below target in the near term amid declines in petrol prices. Remember, 
oil went from $75 in the last quarter all the way down to 42 So the net feed through into petrol prices is quite an immediate one in that sense. But, petrol, but they're thinning then. Well, inflation has fallen, but it's due to petrol prices. So it's kind of like trying to quell any fears or misinterpretation that inflation is falling, we need to start cutting rates, so we need to start doing something else to kind of prop it back up again. It's, well, hang about. Wages are going up, unemployment's very low, inflationary conditions are there. This is just a byproduct of a function of oil prices decreasing 45% over the course of eight weeks. Um, rates, so interest rates, the big one, maintain guidance of monetary policy to be tightened over the forecast period. But the Bank of England's language, when they say forecast period, they're referring to what's called the two-year horizon. So it's a two-year outlook when they say that. Um, at a gradual pace and to a limited extent. So they're going to tighten policy at a gradual pace and limited extent. So if I was to give you kind of a 101 of the, the cultural meetings or anything, you're looking for deviations to these specific words as little telltale signs or hints as towards that they're becoming progressively more hawkish or dovish and so on. Gradual and limited extent, copy paste repeat. You said that exactly last time. So there's not a lot here that's particularly new. The key though, I was just doing a preview earlier before I headed over, the key is this. Remember that today is the quarterly inflation report. So just like the Fed, when I said every alternate meeting is the most important, because that's when you get the clarity with the projections, this event today is the same for the Bank of England. So you get CPI and GDP. Now what do you think in the short term their outlook has changed since three months ago. Do you think they're revising GDP up or down? Down. No, it's most likely going to be down. And inflation, because of the oil price, given that didn't take into account the tank, so are they going to revise inflation up or down? Down. Down. Right, so the question now from a trading point of view is, you've eradicated the rate announcement, you've eradicated the vote split, unimportant. All the language, you're not expecting much change, because Having known this, I'm not looking for any deviation. What I'm looking for then, as to whether or not it's going to move the market, is I know inflation and growth is going to be down. Now is well, how much down? How much they revise, say, growth inflation lower or not? That's now my spectrum of a hawkish reaction or a dovish reaction. So yeah, you've taken quite a lot of information there, but you broke it down into an actionable <coughs> one point thing which means that when you know actually what you're looking for, which is just preparation, you can be quite confident of what you're hearing and seeing at that point. Um, when you're new, I mean, if we had the score con, uh, it's a shame you didn't hear it, because the score could just read the stuff out. Uh, well, if he's good, he will use intonation in his voice to bring draw attention to different things. But these guys are not quite at that point yet, so they'll just read it out. If you hear it on, a, on an audio, it's just literally 0.75%, 9 nil. Says this on Brexit, says this on CPI, 0 0.7%, and all you hear is blah, 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 blah. And when you're new, you're like, what the hell is going on? But if you go through the process we've just discussed, you know exactly, you have this as a crib sheet on your desk. You've got the numbers, and now it's just about where do these new numbers, when they say it, sit in relation to these existing previous numbers. If he attributed um, inflation at 2.1% yep. due to oil prices, yep. is he almost setting a market price for oil? Can you can you assume a price isn't going to hit 75 if, if inflation is going to be less? So you could almost formulate a, a price for oil at a lower? Because he's only got control of the UK economy and it's a yeah, global yeah. product, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd say difficult to draw that kind of conclusion in terms of... Um, I think the, the reaction effect is because that, that size of decline in oil is just so large and it's completely irregular. What happened at the end of last year and the last quarter, um, I think, is a, is a complete one in a decade type move. And, and so he just needs to factor that in because this is where he can use that as a potential element to sound quite hawkish, discounting then it down to a one-time effect. 
So when everything appears quite dovish, don't forget, we've downgraded inflation, we've downgraded growth, we're worrying about Brexit, we're saying policies are going to tighten gradually in a limited extent. However, actually, what we're saying is we scratch it away, there's inflation potentially. So it's kind of, rather than then setting the signal to the market, this is super dovish, he's kind of counteracted it, and he's achieved that goal of being <coughs> fairly on the fence. Uh, his goal today would have been, I've got no idea how Brexit is going to pan out right now, and so all I need to do is try to get this release out in as calm and orderly fashion as possible without us losing our heads. And I guess this is how we <coughs> try to achieve it in, in that sense. Very important, I think, for him today not to be overtly dovish. Um, if you remember one of the briefings, I don't know if you caught it uh, yesterday, there was an ECB source report, and quite interesting that they're using the narrative of sources, so undisclosed people, which I'll explain in our lecture in a second, are the ECB, effectively. It's kind of an unofficial channel to communicate to the market. But they're saying doing these LTROs, those cheap four-year loans, which would be a policy stimulative measure, they've said the sources, that's not a done deal for March. So if you think about it, the Fed is doing all these dovish things, that's created us to think, well, everyone else is going to become dovish, and they're putting out the signal, well, hang about, that's not the case. Because what they're trying to do is manage the situation and keep all options on the table. If the Fed, we know, is super important, and they're going to do what it takes to bail out basically the, the global downturn. But if I'm the ECB, great. Let the Fed do what they've got to do. If I don't need to touch anything, all the better for it. Because then when the fracture of the Eurozone does happen, well, I've got plenty of things I can fall upon. Whereas the Fed have run out of options at that point. So this is kind of the, the management that they go through um, in that respect. Um, the press conference, so exactly the same as the ECB format, this will now go to half past 12, so he'll kick off in 15 minutes, and he talks for about an hour. Um, there's a very distinct process to press conferences with the central bankers, so having been to them, basically, you know, you're all there with all the hacks, and they're there, and all the Telegraph Times buddies are all partnered up, and then there's all like the lower tier press agencies here, and you've got the financial news agencies here, it's got a weird school playground of little groupings. And then when Mark Carney goes and his press officer, there's already a pre-selected list of who and what order they go. And there's a definite hierarchy. So if you're from the Liverpool Echo, I'm sorry, you're last <laughs> at that point. Whereas the guy from Times Chief Economics Editor, he's either number one or number two behind the FT and the, the, the Telegraph guy. Um, that does, though, give you a very clear framework as when the market moves, if there is something, might happen. Because the most pressing <coughs> and potential ones where he might say something always come first. So if you think about it, if I was in an ECB press conference, the first questions I'd ask would be, what do you think about the trade war and its impact on global growth and as a consequence, your policy? Okay, next. What do you think about what's happening with Brexit and the risk of a no deal and its impact on the European economy? Yeah, so all the really juicy ones where he has to navigate without committing, but giving you some kind of clarity, that's where he might make a mistake. Once it gets to the seventh, eighth, tenth question, it's a snooze fest, it's just boring. Because then what, that's not to say you don't have half an ear on what's going on, but you know that probably the bulk of the action has, has finished at that point. Yep. So can we say that his goal is to control risk sentiment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In this case, absolutely. Okay. Given the, the context of the looming deadline for Brexit, this is a, a prevention, almost. Let's just control. Market sentiment right now is actually fairly healthy overall. Post the recovery we've had in January, markets are kind of a little bit at the moment. If you look at what happened, tank key issues to play out. If you think about it from then a non-intraday, bigger investment point of view, a fund manager and so on, do I want to put large capital to play? Well, I don't know the outcome of trade wars. I don't know the outcome of Brexit. What am I going to do? What's the logical answer? Let's just hold off. Let's see. And then we'll, we'll go from there. But all of those deadlines, don't forget, are coming. 
March 1st, March 29th, you know, it's, it's all coming up soon. What you could get then is a lack of real volume, quite sharp little pops in prices, but no real clear direction. And this can be quite dangerous when you're in the intraday. Because when you're new, you can get what looks like a trend, but then it can pull back on itself and so on. So you know, just things to think about. OK. That's enough on that. Otherwise, I'll uh, run out a bit of time. Don't worry, we've got plenty more central bank decisions coming up, I'm sure, in the future. Well, look, this is cable now. Initial reaction, recovery. Because on balance, as we've just gone through and we've discussed, you can see there's already not a great deal happening. For me, given the job I used to do, obviously, all the stuff I've talked about, most traders, uh, if I'm honest, wouldn't really know too much. And they would just depend on me. But what I would want you guys to do, by me talking you through it, I think you can have a hell of a lot more confidence as to what you're doing by at least understanding the process that I would go through. Am I saying you need to do what I'm doing with all the things I've just explained? You don't need to because you can just buy a score, which can cost you a hundred quid, a couple of hundred quid if you're an individual, and it's their job to do this. But I think for me, if you're going to be really effective at trading short-term volatility, you've got to know what it is that you're doing over these events. Okay? Um, so yeah, not really that surprised by that price action. Remember, you get this very tight type of price action, everyone pulls their orders, even though what we're saying is there's a 90% chance this will be largely a non-event, what about the 10%? No one wants to get caught up in the 10%, so no one in the market, we all step out, liquidity dries up, so the bid offers really stretch out, and then bang, it comes out, you get a little knee-jerk reaction, which is small, really, by definition, compared to what it can be like. And we just recover. Yeah. Quite often as well, a function of the initial reaction, um, probably most of you guys have never seen an actual news terminal, like a Bloomberg or Reuters. But if you think about it, you've got the minutes that just got released. So there's like a, maybe 3,000 words. And what happens is, all of the journalists, we go into a room, and it's called the lockup. So we get given the minutes, 30 minutes before it's publicly available. But our phones are taken away, and we, the minutes, and we pick the times we think some a line on GDP, a line on inflation, a line on rates, and so on. Now, what we then do is they give us the countdown, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, and all the journalists go, pop, and on your blue bag, it goes, pop. But if you think of this as a reaction effect, there's 10 headlines that pop on your screen instantaneously, like immediately. So you can imagine what happens. It's quite frenetic, which is why you get this kind of really sharp on a, on a second <coughs> step move like this. Now the algo <coughs> will just go, boom, take what's binary, it's 9 nil, it's 5-4, and it will take action. The human will go, <coughs> you get this kind of post reaction that can take a couple of minutes because we are way more effective than the machine at interpreting nuances of human language because we can be adaptable. What if he says something that's not quite usual or part of the pre-programmed communication strategy? So this is where you know you can get these kind of moves, maybe you get a spike lower and then it drifts up or it spikes high and then it drifts down. That first move is the dangerous one. I always communicate to the newer guys, you want to be looking for the latter move. Because if you think about it, if we were trading this event together live, and you guys were making the decisions, well, hang about, you don't even understand most of the things that just happened. And you're going to trade it? It's like, well, what you're doing now is watching colors on a screen and going, it's going up, I'm going up, it's going down, I'm going to press sell. That's not good enough, I'm afraid. You might as well just go and have, you know, buy champagne, go to the horses and gamble. A lot more fun than it is sitting in an office with me. <laughs> so yeah, it's got to be you know, a conscious decision that you're doing. All right, let's get the slides up and we'll get cracking on the lecture. So I'm a good time for coming to the office. <laughs> Not that bad.
the lecture we're going to do is about exactly what we've really talked about, about the news. So um, really what I've talked about can be applied to some of the slides. So hopefully we've not all been good use of time. Are you going to listen to the first few minutes of the press conference? No. <laughs> no. We'll check back in at the end, and then we'll see what the chart's done. One thing that happens um, that I used to use as a bit of a secondary, or can often be even a first guide, is, so I'd look at all the news that was coming out, let's say, but then I've got all the charts. And actually what I have then is, I, if a chart moves, so let's say I'm looking at cable, and if there's a big event coming up, typically I'd have cable up on a bigger chart 10 minutes before the event comes out. Now what happens if all of a sudden, boom, chart just spikes, and it's three minutes before the event? I know something's happened. So then I know there's got to be news somewhere. So sometimes the chart is your guide. Like, we just look back, I mean, we did it the reverse. We, I put my neck on the line a little bit there saying this doesn't look like it's a moving event. Could have been we put the chart up and I'm completely wrong, but you know, the analysis is there, <coughs> and the movement is there. Normally though, you look at the chart and you can tell, okay, he must have said something very dovish here because it's just fallen 100 pips. So therefore then I'm looking for what is it? And so you're, you're kind of looking in the right area then. So when you're trading these, sometimes you get, if you saw a massive pop, or let's say the opposite, massive spike, and it happens immediately, given the sequence the news comes out, it's probably 8172. Someone has voted to hike. So the first input that goes into the machines out of the news that comes out is 72, completely unexpected. The machine long, immediate, and out. As soon as it spikes at that point. So, you know, in the the price movement can be very telling. Unfortunately, when it comes to the price movement side of things, there is no, I'm afraid, substitute for just screen time to learn that kind of price recognition. It will just develop over time. Um, okay. So, to give this some context as we kick off, we talked on Monday about all these kind of big top level issues. What hopefully I can do over the next hour or so is explain a little bit more of a structure to approaching the news. Exactly like what we just talked about really. There's Bank of England event, and they talk about Brexit, and you've got to understand these key issues. What we really just talked about was what's the framework to train this event? How do I break it down more definitively? So that's kind of what we're going to look at throughout today. Um, we really have looked at this already. Um, I use this always as a standard example about this understanding that you can't really be completely 100% one or the other. It's about an understanding or an appreciation, at least, of each discipline. You guys have these slides? No. No, no. back? All right, well, what I will do is I will Hello there, just in a different order. Everyone got it? I, I, I can send them out electronically as soon as we're done. No, just at the back of the section. Back of the section. So, these two symbols overlapping in an equal measure, well, I've done that like that on purpose to help me explain that really this is a false, this is a false representation in my mind of what your knowledge needs to be. The answer as to how much these overlap or how big or small or big each one is, is completely down to you. The point being is that <coughs> as Piers would have explained in that process that he discussed of how we approach like a, a trade or investment strategy, it starts with my fundamental analysis. So the, what I get from the basis of that is a directional um, view. I think pounds going up because Article 50 is going to get extended, as per the press this morning, I'm not going to have a no deal, therefore I'm, I'm going to be lost at this point, let's say. Well, that's fine, but we all know 
that it's not quite as simple as then just taking a long position. What I need to do is pinpoint specifically of where am I going to get in the market, where am I going to put my stop, how am I going to manage the risk, what's my targets, how achievable are they, how much risk am I taking for the, for the reward. You know, so everything is then derived from a technical setup of how the chart is. So if anything, this just gives me a view, and a view only, but that is redundant without then having the framework of how do I execute this idea that I want to put in the market. The next layer of this, of course, is probably the most difficult one. You know what you should do, then you've got to do it. And that's really tricky on the psychology side of when you know, taking a position, executing it, and managing the risk appropriately is kind of the one step beyond this, which we'll talk about later. Key things are, um, just given the fact that most people I encounter now with Amplify tend to come from a, a kind of technical background, no problem at all if you're 95, 99% technical. I have no issue. I sit with Sam, and I would say Sam is, I don't know what he qualifies himself as, but I'd say he's probably 80-20, 80-20 in terms of how he views the market. Now. The 20% though means that he's not going to go long into a market that fundamentally is saying to go short. So he's using the fundamental analysis as an additional factor to have a better, more cohesive bulletproof strategy where he's not taking inappropriate risk that's against then events that might unfold. So that's from a direction. But what about the timing? Knowing when someone key is going to speak when a rumor could come out, when there's a big piece of economic data, these are all fundamentals, which need to, you need to have an awareness of to deploy these strategies more effectively. Um, one thing I can say is when I worked previous job it with all institutional clients, the technical analysts absolutely were on top of the bigger picture. Now, could they talk again like the economists or strategists? No, well, it's not really their job to go to that depth. But do they know just generally what's going on? Absolutely. How can you do decent technical analysis without knowing the bigger broader picture of things? Yeah. Um, likewise, for me, let's say I'm heavily tilted this way. Again, I have to use technicals. Uh, there's no ways about it. How do I know how to get out, get in, and then these types of things? So it's about finding, and hopefully in the longer term course, you'll find your own confidence is what I mean. And if it ends up being heavily tilted this way, as long as you've learned your lessons of how to avert unnecessary danger, well then my job's been achieved at that point. I'm not saying, and you know, I'm the kind of dictionary example of Mr. Fundamental, I'm not saying you need to be like me. Because quite frankly, there's not many people that have that kind of view. Because at the end of the day, I'm an analyst by trade. Yeah, the traders are traders. But if you can bring in some of that, it's going to help that, undoubtedly. I have no, no question in my mind. Okay. Um, this, I think we've touched upon this before. Um, quite simply, the prioritizing of these subjects we discussed on Monday. Now, as we ascertained, there's lots of subjects we could potentially throw up here. I mean, actually, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you know, all the way through to things like, I don't know, what's happening in Venezuela, quite a key issue, people are talking about it. Does it cut the mustard to get right up to the, the top? <coughs> Probably not, it's lower down on the pyramid. So then from a global macro point of view, trying to ascertain intraday sentiment point of view, what happens in Venezuela might, it would have already done so, could impact oil. But it, is it going to make me, as a NASDAQ trader, go, right, I better sell the NASDAQ right now? Or I better start shorting the British pound because of what's happened in Venezuela? No. So it's an isolated thing. Like what we've said, Brexit is relative at this point, an isolated thing, moving UK assets and some European ones by the threat of a no deal. The big one was trade war because of the fact that it affects the two real key players globally and it's not just a trade war, of course, with China. The US has got in their crosshairs lots of other countries as well. 
So it's a massive key issue that then, by default, when you're looking at news coming out, <coughs> you've almost got like a scale of Trump. Trump, in general, probably takes about 50% of the entire market focus from a news perspective in the fact that of moving news or moving assets. Then you've kind of got all the other things down below. What I try to do is every day objectively review this kind of pyramid or hierarchy to think, has this changed? And now to think about has it changed, well, what do you think this will look like on March 29th? EU at the top. Right. So these will move up on that one moment in time. So then, if there is, it's literally, because it's 11 p.m. on that day, so obviously there's an hour difference. If it's 10.30 that evening, people in America, people in Asia, no one will care about trade war. No one will care about you know, anything else going on in their domestic market. The only thing the markets will look at, whatever it is, it will be like this, Brexit. Because we've got 30 minutes at that point. Because you know? don't forget, all of this is a reflection of our behaviors. And we are very quite simple things at the end of the day. We're not, we don't have an ability to have multiple things firing off. We tend to latch onto one narrative. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of explain that, but it's very important uh, in that sense. So, yeah, prioritizing the news, critical. Because otherwise, as you guys might have done so before, hopefully coming on this course, you might have gone, where do you even start? You know, there's so much. I mean, if I just sit there watching the news all day, when am I ever going to do anything? So I absolutely agree. So you have to apply some kind of structure to what you're looking at. Otherwise, you would literally sit there and you would get not a lot done. Like you're not, you wouldn't be very efficient with your time. Um, this is <coughs> explaining, I, I guess, breaking fundamental events into two distinct parts. And quite simply, this is scheduled. So things like economic data, central bank speakers, government bond auctions, corporate earnings we discussed yesterday. These are all set in stone. You already know about it the day before, the week before, the month before, so on. Unscheduled events, obviously, completely different. Think now of your psychological response to, forget finance, information when you're expecting it and when you're not expecting it. Usually it's radically different. A preparation, making a conscious decision of something you're expecting compared to fight or flight, system one or two response. That can be highly, or can lead to highly irrational behavior in that circumstance. So when there's unprepared news compared to scheduled events, the response in the market can reflect that type of human behavior. If something's really negative, I think I gave the example, and it comes out negative, even though it's bad, we're like, mm, okay, it's bad. If something comes out of the blue, think about it. The price reaction causes an immediate knee jerk. Even though it might come back and kind of progress back to where it was, the point is to get these big spikes. With that being said, okay, you might say to me, well, I am unscheduled news. My God, Paul, we're going to sit there and think about every single possible thing that can happen on planet Earth. No. You tell me, what, what could be a hypothetical headline this afternoon that could move global financial markets? List, list me out the top three. Tsunami? Yeah, that definitely could happen. Um, with that being said then, what, I mean, how many, you know, let's take March 2011, the Japanese um, huge earthquake in Fukushima. How many earthquakes are there per year in Japan? Like thousands. Yeah. So how many, how many are there, um, I'm going to say moving, so say if you saw a headline, buildings in downtown Tokyo moving due to earthquake and tremor. For me, okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's Thursday, we're about June. Yeah, so these are the types of things where actually, even though it's unscheduled, because it's such a regular occurrence, you could almost expect 
it could happen. So it's unsurprising. Now it becomes moving over here. It's almost scheduled. You get like clockwork. We're due one now. It's every other day, almost. Won't be late. What else? Think about this afternoon with the pyramid. What's a hypothetical headline that could come out this afternoon? Trump, Trump, tweets, something. Something. Trump tweets something. He says, China, screw you. OK? What's the probability of that? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's definitely a possibility, right? Uh, what else? One more. May has a heart attack. May has a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. What's the probability of that happening? That we should be thinking. 0.02%. Could it happen? My God, I would definitely understand why if it did happen. So what I'm saying is, even though there's, um, to break down and make it a bit more manageable, being very proactive and being able to respond to trade <laughs> news, my head, I already start thinking about what could the news be this afternoon. I don't even remember yesterday when I did the briefing. I found a UK journalist, Paul Brand of ITV News, a correspondent, and he had all the definitive meeting times of the Tory Conservatives meeting May in her Northern Irish trip, then Sinn Féin, and then the DUP, all at exact times. So from that, I can derive then an agenda of her day and a structure of the meeting that's <coughs> happening. I can then start to have a pretty educated guess at when her conclusion of talks will be with the DUP as to then mapping it off the previous meeting times. So for everyone else who sits there going, I wonder if we'll hear anything about Brexit, I know exactly almost the sweet spot of minutes within one day of where, when that news comes out, I'm all over it. And you're sitting there going, what's going on? So this is the difference where this stuff is scheduled. I don't know she's going to say something. I'm just hypothesizing that if there's going to be unscheduled events, I can already start predicting what these might be, dependent on my pyramid. There's no point me stressing about the Greek PM resigning. It's of no consequence, because no one cares, in terms of what's going to move markets in that way. You see what I mean? It's like talking about oil prices. If oil prices go down to, I think oil producing nations will say, what would be a, a common sentence? So oil, fiscal break even on average for a gold nation, 100 plus. Oil's trading at 26. What do you think that they're likely to, what would Nigeria say? Right. I think we should cut production. Well, oh my God, you're, you're an oracle. How do you know that? Well, hang about, this isn't scheduled. I'm just going off logic here. So I can almost predict then what they're gonna say. Now it's just a matter of timing and when are they gonna say it? So these are all things where, for me, it's kind of like a bit of a game of chess when I'm thinking a couple moves down the line. And then, for me, rather than the stuff that you know, almost you've got this roadmap in your head. And when things happen, you can act really fast with high conviction. Yeah? So this is kind of getting into the realm of um, how definitely someone like Will or Piers would think. I mean, they'd lean on me to come up with a lot of the ideas, if you like, but ultimately, they think the same thing. When they're sitting there, they've already thought through. What if Theresa May just resigns? What if Trump gets shot? What if, you know, every single thing, but every single thing that's relevant and plausible. There's no point going, what if Trump becomes this magical, nice person, and he's like, marries Pocahontas, and the whole world's utopia, and, like, there's no point stressing about things that aren't going to happen. And so, you know, it's kind of a, a, a distinct way to approach it. Uh, this slide's just to, to, to show you or explain to you a bit of a difference between the way that information is delivered or disseminated between the Western developed market and Asia. Um, let's see if I can put that screen on actually. What I mean by this is, uh, I don't remember when it was, but um, I had to set up a, a, an Asian desk doing the squawk with my team overnight. Uh, so I had, to, I had the pleasure of working overnight in London for a year. 
Um, but what it was great for was I got to watch Adrian Marquez firsthand sitting there throughout the whole night, every night. Um, and what I noticed was quite a distinct difference in the way in which news is disseminated. Now, big problem we have in Asia, obviously, is language and also geographic timing. If you think about Asia or the region in the Far East, you've got literally different market opens for every different area. New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, you start getting the other regions, China, Hong Kong, Japan, India, and they all kind of slot into one another. Each one as well obviously has its own uh, local language. So when it comes to getting, having access to information, um, what I found was that it was incredibly difficult. If you were going to trade news, trade the news, almost entirely impossible to do it effectively overnight. Um, I'll give you an example with the Bank of Japan, um, or not the, just the Bank of Japan, but just generally Japanese equity information. I'd be there, and I would know all my Nikkei 225 companies, just like we talked about the FTSE, and all of a sudden, boom, a company shares, Nikon shares, Spike, whatever the company might be, and you go, you're looking at the screens going, what? I'm going, what on earth did that just happen? And then 10 minutes later, Bloomberg will say, a Japanese press agency has said this. So essentially, you have to be looking or interpreting the news firsthand in the local language if you're ever going to entertain it. So for most people, I'd say it's probably an area where you're not going to have enough information to have. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't trade the bigger macro picture still. Something like the Australian dollar, quite liquid overnight, and actually it's a good proxy for trading economic sentiment over China, given the high dependence in their trade relationship. But sometimes if you get a China negative story developing and you have a good technical setup in the Aussie, that can be quite a nice trade at that kind of time, talking 2 a.m., 3 a.m., that kind of time. Um, the release of economic data is radically different as well. Um, the clearest one is uh, Bank of Japan, for example, and this might help a little bit about how they work, is um, in Japan you still have a lunch break. So markets close for lunch. Obviously that doesn't happen here, um, but from a strategy point of view, the Bank of Japan, when they have an interest rate decision, you know what day it's coming out, you just don't know specifically what time. So you go back and you accumulate the data as to what's the average time of release, and they typically release during lunchtime. Why would they opt to do that? Why would the Bank of Japan choose Stop to the release spikes. it? Right. Yeah, remember that very first slide on the monetary policy. What is most central banks' objectives? Stability. No, they want stability. They don't want erratic movement. What they want is an orderly digestion of information as to what they think over the, the horizon. And so to manage that, you know, if you think of the process, we all get given the paper, we have an hour to then digest it, talk about it, talk to each other. Do you think it's hawkish? Do you think it's dovish? Market opens and then it just gradually trends. The Bank of England at 12 o'clock, it's, we're all there like this. We think we know what we're looking for. And then, boom, 10 comments, squawks going off, and everything dumps on you. So you can imagine the movement's much more violent in that sense. The other thing, again, is clearly behavioral, is I've sat there overnight <coughs> waiting for this, which should be around, let's say, two, half past two a.m. And I've sat there, and it's got to 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. What starts to happen in that situation for you as a human? You get anxious. And you get anxious, right? What does that lead to? Bad decisions. Yeah, bad decision. It leads to me panicking, questioning what's going on, why is this happening? And I kid you not, markets start moving in a negative way, which is just purely a function of us going, there must be something wrong. There's no factual information, it's just us trading each other, and it almost, you have a catalyst that snowballs that then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Um, so you know, these things do play out from time to time. China is even one further step removed. Remember what I said about these guys, the ECB, Fed, we know 
a year, two years, the Federal Reserve, three years in advance, who the members are, when the meetings are happening. In China, you don't know when the next interest rate meeting is full stop. There is no schedule at this point. So they can hold an interest rate announcement whenever they want. There's no schedule. So that adds a completely different spin on this kind of very form formulaic way of communicating. So you know, something to just, just be aware of. Again, how do I go about understanding when could they take action? Well, remember that last slide, that <coughs> conversation. If the economy is tanking, 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 what's the inevitable? Central banks got to do something. Support. Yeah, so then they've got to support the economy and probably cut rates at that point. So even though there's no schedule, I can apply some degree of trying to understand what could be an outcome. Um, yeah, so the, the US, the, the ECB, the Bank of England are much more structured in that sense. <coughs> okay, a few other things to have a look at. Um, this is just to give you an overview of different uh, services and why people might look at them. Uh, these are all, and this isn't everything, but obviously Bloomberg's the main one. To give you an idea when it comes to news, I'd say Bloomberg dominate the market at least 80%, if I was going to put a, a number on it. They are the benchmark and the main feed at which investment professionals, so by default, move the market, are looking at. Next then is probably Reuters, uh, the European kind of competitor. Dow Jones, much, much, much smaller in terms of news. Um, and then you, <coughs> run, you get FT, Journal, things like that. Um, if from a, uh, a central banker or important market um, person who can move prices, obviously they're going to want to communicate to the people directly who make investment decisions. So you're getting a bulk of your information from here. On this side, these are all kind of TV channels, so very much dependent on what it is that you're trading. Um, CNBC is very good at single stock US focused information because it's based on the noisy floor. They get good hearsay from the traders who are working on the floor and they also get exclusive comments, but it's nearly entirely single stocks. So if you're America, like we said at the beginning of the week, it's great. If you're in London, it's so drama drama that it actually is quite frustrating to watch. And then really it's not that relevant because it's stocks. I don't want to offend any Americans if there is any. I apologize. Um, but these are <coughs> other ones, Sky News, only thing Sky News is good for is terror alerts. That's pretty much where it begins and ends. Um, remember, these guys have about, you know, two, just over two and a half thousand journalists, all which are financial journalists, basically. These guys need to break news. And so, yes, you hear 99% of the time jump. But if there is a terror status or an alert or a situation unfolds, they're normally quite quick. But I'll show you ways much quicker that you can get on social media than you could here. Um, BBC News, very good for geopolitical events. Um, go back to 2014, 2013, Russia, Ukraine, for example. Well, how my mind works is, you know when you watch the news and you see the guy with his hat on and his jacket, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm in, you know, Eastern Crimea, on the, the eastern side of Ukraine, and being shot at, and he's like, yeah, I'll see you again in another hour for my next update for 60 seconds. So me, I go, well, who's that guy? What's his name? Who is he? Can I get information? Does he have a list? Is he on Twitter? Does he tweet? How often does he tweet? What does he say? What language is he tweeting? This, to me, is a potential arbitrage to get information. And again, it's only because of the way I'm trained. My job basically was AMP, here's like a budget, go out there and get information any way possible above board um, in that sense. So my mind is very curious as to do this and this can be very good. Another thing on this point is whenever you guys read the FT or the Times or the Telegraph, whatever it is, if you ever read an article, well, you tell me this, when you read the papers at the moment, if you ever do buy an actual paper, that is. Um, how often do you actually go, who wrote that? Or who's, that, who's this journalist? What's his background? How long has he been doing it? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. 
And then I go from taking quite a fixed old piece of information to actually every now and again you find someone who, because he's a journalist and all he wants to do is be number one breaking stories, he go, I want to be the best. He's tweeting information from literally the halls of Westminster. They come out of an MP's meeting, a cross-party deal being brokered, he tweets it 10 seconds after it left the lips of Jeremy Corbyn. Sky News, BBC News, it's five minutes. I'm in, I'm out. You are the guys going long, taking the other side of my trade when I'm coming out. More often than not, if you're really drilling it down. You know, so this is the, the benefit of using these different, these different kind of services. Bloomberg Television, I'm sure everyone might have come across that. A um, couple of things to be aware of. One, um, this is a, a lost leader for Bloomberg. I think, well, it's only recently that they've started to monetize the model on their website as a subscription paywall. Before, it was all free. Bloomberg Television is purely done as a platform for sell side institutions to speak and to draw us into the Bloomberg terminal, which they derive nearly all of their income from. As we said, a Bloomberg system costs $50,000. So a big major investment bank takes 20,000 of them every month on a subscription. So the math is the model is built on that. What you can get from this though, for you guys, is really two things. One, I would say learning finance is a little bit like, or markets is a little bit like learning a foreign language. You might, and absolutely, I know when I first read the FT, my first day at work, I was just like, mm, okay. I want to admit that I don't get 75% of what this newspaper is saying. Well, I got taught pretty quickly that yes, I should fess up and go, I don't understand it. But the point being is well, that's fine. The more you watch this, the more you start getting used to how they describe things. What is the language that they use? What is the common theme that the herd, the marketplace is focused on as its pyramid and hierarchy of macro themes? This isn't just me making assumptions about I think trade war is the best or the most important issue, I listen to the head of every major US bank every time he comes on, I want to know what they're saying. Yeah, the secret to what I do is all I do is I listen to everyone and I go, yeah, I like that, yeah, I like a little piece of that, oh, that sounds good, yeah, I really agree with that and I form my own opinion based on their facts. So I'm not a genius. I'm just very good at aggregating lots of information. That's it. I watch Bloomberg quite a bit. And yep. you might get the CEO of this investment yeah, yeah. fund. Yep. And he's saying, if it was me, I'd be looking at going short on oil. Yeah. Yep. I'd be looking to sell. Yep. An hour later, they've got the CEO of another fund. Yep. And he's going, well, if it was me, I'd be looking to buy all that. Now, yeah. How do you yeah. differentiate? So, absolutely can sympathize with what they're saying. I would say then I just need to expand my sample size to get that directional bias and whether or not on balance people are more bullish or bearish. I would say you do get conflicting opinions. And to explain this a little more, the small, generally the smaller the bank or the research firm, the more outlying their view is. Now the reason for that is if you think about it, they cannot compete with the consensus view because why would I go with the Dutch bank ING, for example, when I can go to JP Morgan. It's just not going to work. So what do ING do? They go, actually the pound is hugely undervalued and we should be long now. We're calling 150 in six months on the back of a, a version of no deal and we're going to have an orderly Brexit. Actually, if you look at it, nearly every outlying one is a smaller one. So do I take... Uh, absolutely as gold what the big banks say no what is important though is what's the collective and coordinated message as a whole so what i would do in your instance is i would actively search the web or look at the ft where you get quite a lot of that information for me uh, i get sent research and things like that watch bloomberg other cnbc and try and get well on balance that they're more this way or the other, that's all. Um, usually, it's very rare that it's 50-50, to be honest. It's normally slightly tilted one or the other, I would say. Um, but I know the underlying point you're making. 
they're all uh, Dell boys trying to push their position. They're just doing it in a very eloquent, dressed up way. But yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Trying to sell an idea or a position. Um, so yeah, this can be good to build your understanding of markets for sure. Remember, what it is that these guys are talking about helps you formulate a more cohesive view on markets for sure. Moving on to here, the only one I'm really going to focus on and explain is, is uh, Twitter. So let's jump straight to something. Um, to explain, I'm going to give you the overview of why people uh, look at Twitter. On Friday, tomorrow, I'm going to bring up Twitter and I'll bring up the system and we'll go through it step by step. Uh, and I'll explain to you how I use it and then you can make your own choice whether you want to use it or not. Um, so to dispel a few misconceptions, Twitter has been used uh, for prop trading for many, many years. Way supersedes Mr. Trump becoming US president. He's just the latest thing that for the saving grace of Jack Dorsey, who owns Twitter, saved their share price. But um, Twitter was used you know, for many years. Now for me, a uh, short story is that I started using monitoring inbound tweets probably about 2010, around that era. So that's maybe a decade ago. And at the time, people were highly critical of me doing it because they thought I was wasting a lot of my resource, either me or someone in my team doing it. Um, what happened was we, I kept seeing opportunities for people brokering news on, on Twitter. Now, a real key distinct difference here is for a story to be published on Bloomberg, it must, it must be authentic i.e. if there's a rumor Theresa May is going to resign, it has to be number 10 has said Theresa May is going to resign. They cannot put out, there's a rumor that Theresa May is going to resign. They're not allowed to say that, in fact. Even if the pound was dropping like a stone, Bloomberg cannot say that because it's not authenticated news. So if you think about it, you're missing a massive amount of opportunity by relying on these traditional resources. So it has its pros and cons in that sense. Now, we then set up a system where we had a designated guy just watching Twitter as a full-time job. Um, then in April 2013, yeah, beginning of April 2013 was when the Boston Marathon bombings happened. Remember that? The two brothers were on the run. Um, now, not that that caused a, a, a big reaction in the markets, but what happens on the back of that is that naturally terror alert status in various western cities goes up a notch. So for me and the guy on the team looking at that, he then starts going into a higher state of vigilance looking for potential terrorist activities. The way terrorism tends to work is because we as western media love publishing pictures of terrorism and kind of almost glorifying it, it almost cultivates then more people to get into terrorism, so on and so forth. So there's a distinct pattern between terrorism can lead to more terrorism, yeah, in that sense. So I think it was about two weeks later, we had this tweet come out. Now, at the time, the guy, the guy who was squawking it was still relatively new. So this is kind of how uh, a squawk, this is how a squawk sounded when he said it. Breaking two explosions in the White House, Barack Obama is injured. AP News. Now, AP News, if you know Associated Press, their Twitter feed has uh, probably now 12 million followers. So it's not a small account. It's one of the biggest news agencies in the world. Verified account. It was a genuine account. Obviously, the way he said it was the complete opposite of what I did immediately after he said it which was basically gave him an elbow to the head, pushed him out of the way, and I started screaming the house down when this came out. Because as far as you can tell, it's genuine news. So this is not on Bloomberg, it's not on Sky News, it's not on Reuters, it's just a tweet that's just dropped down on a page like this. But he just so happened to get it one second after it came out. This was the Dow Jones, immediately upon release of that tweet. Remember, this is completely out of the blue. I remember when it came out, it was just after uh, midday. The Dow immediately started selling, 
But if you remember the function of the market and how it operates, particularly with automated systems, markets just tank. And when you get a massive order of sell orders rushing to the market, all the systems see this activity and take advantage of that, and they sell. And so the move becomes very pronounced very quickly. So within 30 seconds, we've had quite a violent drop in the, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, we then found a, a, a guy who was photographing the president, who was a Time magazine photographer. So I'm on the squawk talking you guys through this. Because when I have been on a trading floor doing my job previously, when something like this happens, half of you are switched on and you're able to react. Half of you are running around like blue ass flies going, what the hell is going on? And, 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 what's going on? So what, how do I control hysteria? I start talking a bit deeper, very calm. I keep the dialogue running. I let you know what's going on. We're checking into it, we're now seeing this tweet. And literally, this is what I was taught to do as, as a job, because you guys need to rational, rationalize the situation when otherwise you're completely out of control. Found that tweet, he said about the time photographer denying it, that it's false and he's with the president. Some traders at the time, clients we had reversed their positions, wrote it all the way down, all the way back up. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't sit there waiting every day for the what if. This is literally the once in a few years opportunity. But we used to get paid, to give you an idea, those who are able to take advantage of this type of short-term volatility. Banks used to pay us month to month, a rolling subscription fee. And they were paying us three years in advance after four minutes work. Yeah. So you can do the math on what you could have achieved if you had the advantage of getting the news first. Bloomberg ran the headline here. AP News says, explosion at the White House. What did the market do? The market's already gone, come back, gone sideways, and they released the news. So it was immediately after this, in April, and again, true story, Bloomberg came, <laughs> Sam, the guy was, came to my office and he said, and there's my resignation. Day after, and, I, and he went to Bloomberg. And now Bloomberg have a full designated uh, six-man team that monitors Twitter 24 hours a day globally out of London. I've seen it, it's pretty cool, it's just one long desk about the size of this room and they all sit there just looking at Twitter. Yeah, so this was the one that really changed the game that meant that really you had to have it. With the rumours, with these opportunities, the way that the markets work now, especially with Brexit, if you think about Brexit, it's nearly entirely rumours. This could happen. He's saying that. She's thinking this. And actually, if you think about it in the short term, nearly every one of those creates a potential for a market move. Yeah. So it's almost an essential thing. And tomorrow I'll show you uh, the setup of how, how to get the system running. Um, this case study is just to show you an example of the difference that time makes to the impact of news. And secondly, how to manage a rumor you ever heard one. First of all, this was at 5.42 in the evening. I remember it very clearly because at that time there was only me and then there was one other of the guys in the court that was in the, in the room. Everyone else had gone. Um, I heard the squawk then say, um, Telegraph tweet, there's been a breakthrough in the Brexit negotiations. This was about um, the divorce fee. Basically, there had been a compromise, a fee had been agreed. It's a positive. The problem is, course six in the evening. Now remember, this is back in 2018, yeah, well this is actually further back than that, this is 2017. So what was happening here was the reaction is only Americans really in the market. If you're an institutional like FX trader, you're long gone at this point, you're home. Americans, not so savvy on the nuances of the Brexit situation. They're probably much more now, they definitely weren't 18 months ago. So there was a massive time advantage here. Because also, how many Americans are looking at the Telegraph Twitter account? They're just not looking at it. So all they rely on is the squawk says it, the squawk then is used in New York and Chicago, the broker hears it, the broker calls the trader, the trader puts the trade, the trader calls the client, the hedge fund XYZ. And so you've got plenty of time to 
to get into that tray. The difference is here, if this was at 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 a.m. London time, you could have had exactly the same news, and it would have had exactly the same level of impact, but it would have occurred in a radically different way. It would have just gone like that. So when the news comes out and where it's originated from is very important. Remember what I said, Bloomberg carries 80% of the financial news. And I said Dow Jones, for example, or Wall Street Journal is way smaller. So what if something comes out from the Wall Street Journal first? People on Bloomberg are not going to see that instantaneously. Now, I would, because I'm looking at everything. And then you've got that time advantage to be able to get in the market before then the rest of them hear it. Here then, and this is a good point of how news agencies work, market's gone higher. Now let's say this isn't the Telegraph, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg say Brexit deal. We all start buying the pound, the pound starts rallying. Now, if you're a Reuters employee and you're on the news editor floor, at that point that the market's rallying on the Bloomberg headline, you are literally getting it, I'll use the neck, rather than somewhere else. You're getting it in the neck, to put it mildly. Because you've lost this battle, and you've not lost it, you've spectacularly failed at your job. Why on earth would anyone want to buy your system? Actually, Reuters, you can cancel that contract for 20 grand a month. That's what's at risk here for these news agencies. Uh, the KPI of these places is three seconds. Every day, they sit there, at the end of the day and the beginning of the day when you work on the Bloomberg News Speed News desk and they run through how many times did you beat Reuters and how many times did they beat you. And if it's too tilted the other way, you're fine. You're not good enough at your job. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. When the market rallies on the Bloomberg headline, this nearly always happens. There's really two outcomes. One, Reuters comes out because everyone's been forced to then get their contacts to come back with some sort of rebuttal to the headline, and they nearly always say the opposite. Why? Well, they need to remain that they're a value-added product, and if they just add to the story Bloomberg's already done, well, what do you need Reuters for? So they nearly always try to find someone who'll say, who says the other side and creates a meaningful callback. The other thing when there's a rumor is and I would do the same, and I used to, even as an analyst rather than a journalist, I'd call number 10. I would literally call number 10. If there's a situation at Heathrow Airport, I used to call Heathrow Airport. So this is the difference between waiting for news or going out there. And actually what I would do is I'd go to King's Cross and Liverpool Street, and I would start befriending the employees there, and they would tell me if anything ever happened at that point. And so, when you're executing these trades, what can be most effective is if you have a rumor, typically from a duration of trade point of view, you've got to be quite proactive in booking that trade at, more often or not, the earliest possible opportunity. Now, if you have some size, you can go into a trade with multiple contracts. The first point of logical target, you want to be booking half of that trade, if not two thirds, because the risk here the market might snap back against you, but if you've already closed out most of the position, then you've got the luxury of being able to hold on for the point of if it continues to run. But you're managing the trade accordingly. Yeah. The, so the end thing here is about A, the, the way in which news can differ dependent on time of day and where it come from, and then B, if you ever did get rumors, you want to be quite quick in booking your profits. It's not the situation where you've got a nice technical setup with a nice fundamental bias, and actually I'm gonna get in here, I'm gonna hit the top end of yesterday's range, then I'm gonna hit the weekly range, different type of trade at that point. Yeah. So how did that one play out? And it looks, it looks like it nearly went back up to the high afterwards. Yeah. Okay, good question. So here, there's a Brexit deal, Telegraph the saying, um, this was then denied by government officials, but, what, what do you think at that point? Let's say, forget what you know at the moment. There's been a rumor, an undisclosed source has said, we're about to have a deal, it's the compromise in Europe for 39 billion. They deny it. It's sort of finalizing a detail for the end of Right. Yeah. 
the normal assumption is there's no smoke without fire. And so ultimately, there's a deal going to happen. It's just that they just don't want to publicly announce it just yet. So this is the way that rumors very often work. You get that um, initial, kind of the opportunist kind of trade, the speculative, pure speculative trade. You then get the rebuttal, which is often very aggressive. Because if you think about it from a, a concentrated point of view, people are very slow to get in, so it takes time for the move to build up. 20 minutes later, everyone's looking at the pound. Because remember, this is New York time, but now, because of the move, and it's appreciated so much, now everyone's looking at it. So the moment the headline comes out now, you get the return to what should happen, which is a very sharp move. And then it climbs back up as people kind of realize, the realization is a deal is probably uh, more, more than likely to happen. Um, we're going to look at this tomorrow. This is just the system that we use, which is called TweetDeck. The only one thing if I can ask you to do tonight in preparation for tomorrow is register yourself for a Twitter account. Go to twitter.com. Um, if you already have a Twitter account, I would suggest setting up a brand new one and call it Market Joe or whatever you want to call it because you don't want your friends in it, you don't want famous people in it, it needs to be built for purpose. So if you do have your own personal Twitter account, keep it personal. Just have a separate one that you use for trading. So set that up tonight, and I will walk you through it step by step, how you can use it. Because we've only talked about it from a news perspective. It can absolutely be great for learning and keeping your finger on the pulse of the global macro stuff we've talked about throughout the week. Um, I will go through this then tomorrow. Because this is explaining how to verify authenticity of a Twitter account. Remember, every single one of us can effectively get a Twitter account, and you could sit there and go, well, let's see how this goes then. Bank of England say they're going to cut rates. See if that flies. So there is definitely a, a way of going through and validating who are you? Do we need to listen to you? Are you an influencer? Are you genuine? What's the context of your tweets? Who do you follow? What's your following to follow ratio? There's a real checklist that you'd go through quite quickly as to ascertain, is this just some guy or is this something I need to take action on? Uh, so we can have a look at that uh, tomorrow as well. Um, the one thing I would say with Twitter, such as human behavior again, actually doesn't matter if it's fake news. If it's done in a way in which enough people believe it's real and take a trade decision off the back of it, doesn't matter that it's wrong or fake. What you should do though is change your duration of how long you think you can hold that trade, i.e. you want to be pretty quick in getting it on and getting it off if that opportunity ever arose. Uh, I've seen it once before, you remember that hawk, hawk dove spectrum and there was a German guy on the far right who's called Jens Weidmann. I've seen it before where he's tweeted and it's his ECB profile picture, Jens Weidmann, and he said, I think that we should start thinking about cutting interest rates. So this is the absolute opposite of what he should say. And at that point, everyone in the prop world goes, what, 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 what? That's what I get as a response. Because you're going, this would, if that was true, this is huge could be the biggest move that you'll get for months. And what happens is some people just hit it. But then, all of a sudden, the euro starts moving. So those people that were sitting on the fence going, I wonder if it's authentic or not, going, oh my god, it's moving, I'm sure. And it starts coming down. Then I go through my checklist. I start <coughs> like explaining to you that it does not look genuine. In this case, he had, he had done like 15 tweets. I think he had 35 followers. Not, not authenticated, it's like, give me a break. This isn't real. And then market comes back up once everyone comes to that collective understanding. But the German central bank had to issue a formal press statement half an hour later to say this is not an authentic account. So yeah, you, you can get moves in the market that can occur um, in that instance. But we'll, we'll dig into that a little more tomorrow. All right. We're going to take a different tact. We're going to come off the news.
going to talk about economic data for a second. Um, the guys on the career program, we will talk about economic data in lectures at least, I would say, another four times, where we'll go through or explain each data point. I will then do one in stage two, which is more about advanced trading of data uh, and so on. But this is just to give you a couple of pointers as an overview. Um, one is this idea of a tiering system, tier one, tier two, tier three. It's kind of how I classify it. Now, the tiering system is tier one is market moving. Anything tier two or below is non-market moving. So tier one, for example, would be first advanced reading of GDP, an interest rate decision, US CPI, US retail sales, the big stuff. Scale it down then, you get things like uh, housing data or durable goods, which are important, but they're probably unlikely to create a big, meaningful spike, like it would when non-farm payrolls comes out, which would be a classic tier one release. So when you look at that economic calendar, at half past four to five o'clock, and you're preparing for the next day, what you should be doing is highlighting where the key economic data points are. When you look at a calendar, whether it's our calendar or Forex Factory or whatever it is you look at, you'll see that there's probably like 30, 40 different data points. What I want you to be able to do is pinpoint specifically only those that could move the market. So remember what we talked about in the monetary policy example? What are the central bank talking about? That will be a guide. Where are these ind indicators sitting in reference to recent history will be a guide. Yeah, things like non-farm payrolls is just historical. It will always be a market movement, so it always sits higher. Then you can start almost plotting out your day. When do I need to trade? When do I need to stay out of the market? If there's non-farm payrolls, and those who have traded would have seen this, the morning of non-farm payrolls, typically, nothing happens. Most professional traders on the day of non-farm payrolls do not come in until about an hour before because there's absolutely zero point sitting there because nothing happens. Yeah. Reason being is that you know it's going to be a big event and it's going to create market movement. So because of that exact reason, no one's in the market beforehand to trade it. Why on earth would you put a position on ahead of such a volatile, unpredictable release? The thing then becomes self-fulfilling. I don't trade, you don't trade, I look at the volume, it's down, there's no point trading. No one trades, the market goes sideways. That's when there's a novice trader, you go, I'm pretty bored actually, let me just put a trade on. Let me dip my toes in, at least. And then, you're trading a, a basically a range of about five ticks. It gets to showtime, oh, I've just hit my daily loss limit. And then it comes out, it happens exactly like you had predicted, or prepared for, not allowed to trade it. All because of your lack of discipline to wait and be patient. So, you know, just a quite a clear point of that. When, when we look at um, non-farm payrolls oh, yeah. this morning, it was it was seemed to be very predictable over the last 10 years. It was a very kind of predictable range up and down. And so, like, taxi had that's a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why is it such an important economic indicator? Yeah. You're exactly right. In my... Non-farm payrolls, uh, I, will, I get criticized quite a lot because I think non-farm payrolls is complete, like, it's a waste of time, personally. Not only is it dangerous to trade, it has zero relevance, as you rightly said, from a statistical point of view. The point being is that over a 10-year, so this was the financial crisis, this is where we are now, it basically went like this, and then it's gone like that, and then it's gone like that for the last seven years. The reason why the Fed never talks about job creation, they only focus on wages, is because of this exact reason, which is averaging probably about that over time. So you're right, it's, this doesn't mean anything. The only thing that means something is that if I draw, draw you the wages chart, the wages chart has gone like that, I dropped in 09 because there's loads of people looking for work, so I paid them peanuts. And then over time it's done that, 
which is basically nothing, and then we've got to 20, maybe 17 to 19, and it started to do that and come back up again. And because of this relatively new thing that's happening, which then could be a knock-on effect for inflation rising too in the future, that's what we're monitoring for this rate hike cycle. This doesn't matter. The underlying situation here is if I was to do US unemployment, it went like that, and it's gone like this. And in fact, it's gone well below where we were pre-financial crisis, to the point where right now it's record, pretty much record lows. Not just in US, multi-decade lows in the UK as well. So you're right, this doesn't really mean much, but because of historical sake, it still creates this almost euphoria amongst particularly speculative traders where it still uh, creates a lot of focus and so as a net result creates a lot of market interest and then subsequent movement. From an actual practical point of view, if you step away from the intraday and you think about it more from a market directional play from the central bank, it's of zero consequence. That is a, and that is a sub-component of the non-farm payroll report, which is why we watch it. So when non-farm payrolls comes out, final point, actually, there's about 12 numbers in total. The change of jobs, which is that one, is just one. And the wages is actually, there's four that you're looking at, and then we go on and on and on. Um, so the point being is, is that you know, there's, there's a lot of information here that comes out, and in actuality, this initial knee-jerk movement that you get, you're better off just waiting, digesting the entirety of the thing or report, and then making a decision. Uh, and I think that's the point. Um, but yeah, good observation. I think you're exactly right. Um, going back to this idea of data, I just want to give you a simple uh, thing to think about. I know it's not ideal text over the top, but you can see it. Let's just pretend this is US GDP. Uh, it's expected at 3%. It's got a range of 2.1 to 3.8%. So whenever you look at an economic calendar or you're waiting for a big piece of economic data, more often than not, you're kind of focused on this median expectation figure. Uh, GDP is expected at 3%. Important thing though for tier one data to understand how the market might react in the short term is not so much this figure, but these figures, which is a surveyed range of major banks and major research houses. So if it's a tier one economic indicator like non farm payrolls, so we got that 170,000, the top line jobs creation figure. What Bloomberg will do is the benchmark service, they'll call 50, 60 banks and they'll go, what's your number? And HSBC will go 3%, or in this case, GDP, 3%. Barclays, what's your number? 2.1. JP Morgan, what's your number? 3.8. Most people, because they're all looking at the same inputs, they've just got different models that calculate slightly different numbers. But most models will deviate to the mean, in a sense. So you get this normal kind of distribution. Now, what's key then is you've got the expected value. You know now, as a framework, in your mind's eye, what would be the realm of expectation? So now, instead of focusing on here, thinking more about, well, what's going to be something that would breach the upper bound or the lower bound? Now, the data comes, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, and it comes out 3.5%. So it sits, let's say, about here. The initial reaction, if we look at the dollar in isolation, is the dollar spikes up, almost instantaneous, because it's a function of variable A is over variable B, the machine goes by, and then it finds the first possible point of previous area to then get out. Now, one thing to be aware of here is that there's a large, well not a large, there's a minority of the market which actually, this number is disappointing, because they were factoring the 3.6, 3.7, even the 3.8. What happens then is, once the algo executes its trade, the market naturally loses all the bids, 
and it drops because all the buyers have come out of the market. So you get an initial push, then a pullback. What can happen here then is this over a very quick time frame, I'm talking seconds, if you watch it on farm payrolls, it can do quite erratic, sharp movements like this. Now, from an actual practical point of view, what can you can get drawn into as a new trader is you go 3%, 3%, 3%, 3.5, and you go Why do you do that? And that's me pushing the buy button. Why? Because 3.5 is higher than 3%. And two, you just saw the dollar go up. So in your head, it reinforces what you initially thought and verifies that you're right, and so you buy. Now, the point of you making that, de that decision process takes less than half a second, at which point every single algo on the planet has danced around you about a thousand times by the time your synapse is fired. So this is a non-winnable war here, or battle, I should say. So one, it's better left alone. What happens now then is we start to see whether or not under the subcomponents, so if we had non-farm payrolls, and now we're looking at all the other 15 numbers, beyond then the 170 of the headline, what's the wage numbers? So let's say the jobs number comes in at 250,000 dollar spikes, and then we go for, 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 for wages, 2% uh, below the expected 2.4%. That information, which we know has a higher degree of importance for the Fed, so for us, is way weaker and more important than the positive factor that the market originally reacted to. So after the initial spike in volatility, the defining trend thereafter is this one. And so actually, after the spike is done, it's about managing then from a technical previous setup, where is the best point of entry where I can get in and also get out? and be able to manage that trade accordingly. Now, all of this happens. A lot of numbers coming out, a lot of variables, there's a lot of price movement, and things are happening very quickly. So what I'd suggest is a lot of time observing, watching, preparing, reviewing, before you start actually attempting to trade these types of events. Yeah. So it always happens with every single thing. New people are, get really excited by this situation and nearly always lose money with this idea that they can be quick enough without really then um, understanding the full context of what the information is that's been received. It's such a risky trade because you're basically taking a punt that the first input is going to be supported by the other level. Assuming the NFT and labor Yep. So that's out of the US. Yep. What's typically the time frame from that initial? Yeah, good, good question. To stay yeah. yeah, so a typical question then is well, when? Five seconds, 15 seconds, 15 minutes? That answer depends on the composition of these numbers. If this number comes out at 400,000 and this number comes out at only 0.1 lower than expected, I need to take into account then each distribution curve of each variable to see how outlying or not it is. So each one in its own situation needs to be reviewed objectively for the best course of action. Hence then another layer of complexity to add to this. If understanding all of this as a new person, you go, my, my sensible mind is saying, wow, that looks very dangerous, I really shouldn't trade that. Well then, you just could have the right answer, you just hit it on the head. Yeah, because when you're new, when your confidence is still building, and you're still developing your expertise and your underlying knowledge, the worst thing that can be happened here is you get caught up in a messy situation. Because it can really hurt your development. So remember, the most prudent and logical assessment is by knowing all of this, when I'm new, this should be a situation I should stay well clear of. And I should trade something that's much more manageable, that makes much more sense, that I've got much more higher probability of having a better outcome. Then in time, because think about it, there's so many different things, the understanding, your ability to execute under pressure, 
manage trades. Once you get better in months ahead, yeah, start bringing it in. Small size, seeing how it goes, learning, reviewing, doing it again and again and again. Don't get me wrong, my ability to do all this very quickly is because I've seen, I don't know, 300 of these. So I just, I just have a very good feeling for reading many different cues of how the market's reacted to it or what the best course of action might be. But you, you can't shortcut that. You've got to build up to that. And in the meantime, manage it, the process uh, in, a, in a kind of sensible way. All right. Four final points. Uh, yeah, we've, we've kind of touched upon this, but this is a checklist of sorts. This is about preparing for, for major speeches. Uh, and I just kind of bullet pointed it. Um, where are they speaking? What's the topic on? Probably the only one here that I haven't discussed, because I've talked about Q&A sessions like we've got with the Bank of England today. Uh, this idea of prepared text. This is when that example of all the journalists going to a room get given a speech we select all the major comments and we drop it right at a specific appointed time of day. That would be a prepared speech. That's when the function of reaction is much more violent because we have to do information. The opposite of this, unprepared, would be Carney's just talking. So if you think about it as how the markets react to that, it's a lot more smoother and fluid because you're literally listening to him as he's talking. Whereas with this, you have to jump to big conclusions quite quickly. Um, yeah, th we've, we've done this today. So this was just about um, prioritizing order of importance. This is just to give you really what we discussed at the beginning. How do you take what is arguably quite a complex event, but break it down into something that's much more actionable? So it's just a review of what we did. Um, just because I'm mindful that there's some one week guys here, um, this is obviously Trading Live, which is our portal. Uh, the squawk that we have is actually from these guys. Uh, this is one, if you're ever going to trade US stock news, these guys are the best of the business at it. Uh, these guys are, are the best of the global macro side, which is what we're, we're focused on. Um, so yeah, making more sense of the squawk, that's me. And that's my old desk. So you get a sense of if you're really going to stay on top of the news, this is kind of the level that you're doing it at. You're working as a unit, looking at nearly every single thing. So hopefully you can make a little bit more sense why really having a squawk is critical. There's no way that you can do that and trade at the same time. Because the moment you look away from your screen, you're going to miss something. And so you rely on those guys to catch it. Uh, for any younger people, if you're thinking about that as a career, uh, pretty tough because traders are strange beasts. They will never thank you for making the money. They will absolutely crucify you when they lose money because you're the first person that they'll come hunting for. So uh, I kind of got a kick out of that because I quite liked it. The kind of edginess of having someone lay into me kind of kept me on my ego. Um, but a lot of people, it's not really a career for them. As you can imagine, though, doing the stuff like this, you learn very quickly about lots of different things. Nearly everyone who came to our desk and left went on to do predominantly things like asset managing, things like that, where the pace was radically different, but they could apply their kind of understanding of markets in that sense. All right, that is it. Um, Will's going to come over in 25 minutes, 2 o'clock. So you're going to do the psychology session. I absolutely encourage you to really push him on like probing questions because he is someone who, um, yeah, he's, he's like a little fly in